My name is Eileen Dunn, and you're listening to In Conversation With. Hope you enjoy it. Yeah, the third for a second. Yeah, perfect. Um, how was you walking? Huh? How was it? How was I, did, it? I drove in the end because I just got a few phone calls at home, and uh, I ran out of time. Where do you live? I live on the whole road, Ashbrook, oh, oh, Leicester. Nice. <coughs> that would have been. Would that have been near enough? Yeah, you I lived there last year in yeah. Diggs. Did you? Yeah, yeah. all of the area. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they say it's Clontarf, but I'm from old Clontarf, so I consider it Kilesia. Oh. But anyway, but my address <laughs> is Clontarf. We, we, we need Tom here Clontarf. for this. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh, should he be well versed in the Yeah, because like, he, yeah. so I live in Merino, but it's a very fine line between, between Merino, Merino and Fairview. Fairview. Yeah, so like, it's literally at the traffic lights. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we're two houses away from the traffic lights. Okay. But he still claims this is the real Merino. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so he's not very forthcoming. And I'm just in Donny Kearney. But I haven't told it's actually old Donny Kearney and not new Donny Kearney. And not new Kearney. Indeed, all these things are important to some people. Yeah. <laughs> you, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Yes, yeah, well, exactly. Okay. Will you yeah, just jump? Get, get underway. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you're listening to In Conversation with, again, with myself, Colm, and my co-host, Gavin. How you doing? And Greg. Hello. And today we have probably one of the major players in RTE. Uh, broadcasting in general, journalism, newscasting, whatever you want to call it. A familiar face. A familiar face a familiar to face. many people across the country and a familiar voice at that as well. We are joined today by newscaster Eileen Dunn. Good, mor- good morning. Morning, yeah. It's still, it's still <laughs> morning. It is still. It's a bit too early, maybe that's why. Yeah, Greg did give out to me, don't be booking interviews in the morning. Leave us a chance to lie in. I was a bit groggy this morning, I'm yeah. not going to lie. He, he, he did give out to me when I turned I've on got coffee. Room. And all is okay. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, you see that with Graham Norton. In fact, just last week again, you know, uh, we were there today. No, yesterday, you know, because they clearly recorded on a yeah, Thursday yeah, yeah. with yeah, Bradley course. Cooper and Lady Gaga whenever, whenever that interview was. Right, yes, so um, I'll start off as I usually do. Uh, I asked the guests what was the kind of initial thought when, I, when you got the email asking to be, to be on the show. I suppose I think I said yes more or less immediately. Um, I'm I'm always happy to encourage, facilitate, mm. whatever um, younger people and students particularly. I'm involved through I'm involved with the Association of European Journalists, and through that we're involved with the European Commission, and through that I'm one of the judges of the Smedia Awards for European Journalism. Oh yes, the so all that, that's all tied up. I'm doing a thing actually with the Commission next week, so. Mm. People were very good to me when I was a young one, so I like to think that. That seems to be the general. Yeah, yeah this thing. is usually the consensus when we ask our guests is that they re- recognise that we might be, you know, the next What did Ian Dempsey tell us? You, could, you little feckers could be our boss, <laughs> my boss one yeah, day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll start from the, the beginning, I suppose. So did you always have an interest in broadcasting, media, journalism and such growing up? I suppose it was more... Um, not the journalism end, but though my father was a journalist, my father was Mick Dunn, so he was RT's... I have a great segment on that later. Okay, I'm well, a... so he was RT's first Gaelic Games correspondent, but he was in the Irish press. So in my early years, he was in the Irish press. He moved in 1970, so I was 12 then. Um, and I suppose going around the country with him, all that kind of thing. But it was for me, it was more I was into debating and performing, and so it was that side of it first okay. before the journalism side. But in fact, when I was a child, all I ever wanted to be was a teacher. A teacher, yes. And if you ask my sisters, we used to play school, and I was always the teacher. Were you the headmaster, though, or were you like the substitute teacher? No, just the teacher, teacher. and okay. you know, the, the chairs would be lined up, and they were always the pupils, and I was always okay. the teacher. Of course, you did study arts in UCD, so that would always have been on yeah. your mind, I suppose. Yeah. And you did a H-dip, so you probably were leading towards the... I was, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Did yeah. There was ever a possibility, were you ever close to going into the profession? I was, I suppose. I When I finished my primary degree, which was in 1978, I went to France for a year, and um, began to get slightly disillusioned over there and then that 1978 1979 there was a huge postal strike here and the ad went out for radio continuity announcers my father said you should apply for this you know so i applied from france and he applied from here and i always say his application got me to <laughs> he would remember every fesh every medal every everything you know where i just put down abc and i'm miles away you know um so i came home in 79 and That was actually one of the toughest years because I was working, I was teaching in Manor House, which is my old alma mater. I was in UCD in the afternoons and then I was a part-time continuity announcer at the weekends. So you're flat out. So I didn't know which end of me was up, to be honest. So at the end of the year, because I had Irish, I was offered a job in Manor House, so I did have the choice. Mm -hmm. But I went with it. I suppose it was probably a great help to have uh, your dad as such a kind of 
accomplished figure in the field as you were going into it in terms of getting advice, guidance and stuff like sure. that. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Was there one piece of advice that he gave you? Um, I think between him and I had a, we had a producer in the early days, when you were an announcer, you used to do some of the programmes like, you're too young to remember, hospitals requests and Lebanon requests and stuff like that. So it gave you a chance. You weren't just saying you're listening to RT Radio 1. You know, you did get a chance. Orchestral concerts and stuff like that. And Brandon O'Keevan, who was the producer, also dead. Um, and Daddy would have been very similar. So it was all about preparation, like Roy Keane. Every time I hear Roy Keane, I think of them both, you know, um, fail to prepare, prepare to yeah. fail, sort of stuff. You can never be over prepared. And I think O'Keevan liked the way I worked, and I worked the way I worked because I got it from my father, who mm -hmm. was meticulous and would always be well prepared. So I suppose that as much as anything. Now, Daddy didn't really want me to go down the news route. I was I, well, I was going to bring up this because obviously you've said before that your, your own son Cormac doesn't really have an interest in the media and you're not pushing him towards it. Did your dad like have a career in media set in mind for you? Oh, not at all. No. Not at all, no. No, no, because as I say, there was, I was always going to be a teacher and mm. then this came up and he said, he knew I was getting a bit disillusioned and he said, why don't you try this? But it was never really worked out or thought about. And then I think he had visions of me out, you know, chasing around after Charlie Hockey. And he said, <laughs> wouldn't I be a lot better off sitting in a studio presenting a nice program? Was you know. So I think you know. He, Definitely chasing is the key word there. <laughs> yes, <I'd say. laughs> but I, um, you know, I mean, I never have been a real on the road reporter. Mm. So that that never came into play. But I think he he would have been happier. No, he was very proud of me in the end and and liked what I ended up doing. But. I think in the beginning he would have said, you know, be like Kathleen Watkins and do a nice programme on and radio. You know? When you were younger writing, was there ever an inclination for radio or TV or was it a bit of both for you? Oh, uh, and still radio. Mm. I, I, can't, I think we've, there is, we have had a couple of guests that do lean more towards radio. What would it be about radio? It's that far would... more intimate and you have far more control mm. um, because there's only two or three people, as you know, and fewer mm. now as we go on. Uh, whereas in, in television, there's a... Ma a bank of Huge, machines yeah. and people and you you're at the mercy of the machine or the person you're kind of waiting for instruction all the time whereas in radio you can lead more and i suppose even with like in terms of like the camera shot and stuff that's when, right. when it comes to radio you are completely <laughs> dictating i suppose and you can be more comfortable and yeah slouch and do whatever you like <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Except they get caught now because Morning Ireland and those programmes go out on RT News now. Oh, so yeah. You the, can come in at six o'clock in the morning in your t shirt or whatever, but you're still going to be on the camera, <laughs> so you have to be reasonably smart. You know? um, yeah, I, actually, how much has changed now? Because obviously, you joined the broadcaster in, in 1980. As far as technology goes, is, do you feel there's a huge reliance now in newscasting and stuff like that on technology? Like, obviously, you had that quite famous incident where the auto cues and such went down. It's not necessary anymore. Eileen doesn't need to dress. Yeah, well, Eileen, 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 clearly, Eileen didn't, but do you feel is there a reliance on technology? There is, I suppose, but the technology itself has changed. I mm. suppose I'd say that more than anything. I mean, when I, there was always auto cue, so, but when I started, there was a woman used to come in and sit beside me and she typed it and it was like a roll like a roll you'd put in a cash register mm -hmm. or a roll of toilet paper and she spoon fed it through a machine <laughs> and it came up on mirrors. Right. So it couldn't be changed. So if it, cause it was already, and she literally used to cut and paste, you know, so if they were dropping a story, she'd cut it out mm -hmm. and she'd paste these two bits back together. Now, obviously that's all changed. So I just get a thing in my ear saying there's a new story in or there's a story dropped mm -hmm. or the whatever. So, but if let's say, uh, supposing a story was updated during the bulletin, <clears throat> Excuse me. That couldn't. That wouldn't appear on the auto queue because it wasn't possible. And and speaking of that, obviously, time where you you, you did have to quite think on your feet, I suppose. What's going through your mind as the auto queue is down? I mean, so obviously, the whole, you have, it was the sound desk, was it? The whole desk. The whole okay, desk. The whole yeah. desk. Right. So, but again, you see, I'd have been out of there like a scalded cat. But I'm. You're waiting for instructions. Mm -hmm. So, what are we going to do? Is this going to come back? Are we going to be able to reboot it, or what are we going to do? So, eventually, we had to abandon ship and run around the corner. Oh, you changed, oh, yeah. Studio. changed yeah, studio. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when we went into that studio, then we didn't have time to reboot the the auto or boot up the auto queue. <coughs> Excuse me, because um, we hadn't been there, so we yeah. hadn't set it up. So that's what happened. And but you're just waiting for you know for people to decide. Okay, what are we going to do here? Yeah. You know? Did you have a little prayer there just before you? Please come back. Please come back. Please come back. I, or was you kind it? Of, you're just. Well, I, 
you're just in a kind of a zone. You're just yeah. go on automatic pilot and you just do whatever <laughs> they tell you to do. But as I say, you're just really just waiting for instruction. You know? And like the public reaction was like fairly, yeah, uh, mm. fairly po- well, obviously positive. I mean, everybody on Twitter was kind of praising you. What was your kind of reaction to to their reaction? Well, great, I suppose. Okay. I mean, I I kind of thrive in those situations yeah. you know you'll see me uh, they'll hear, you'll hear them and, and if we have a situation like that or a really busy live program in the middle of a big story whatever and they'll say Dunner's grinning she's enjoying herself you know, and I am I love it I thrive in those situations you know right so we'll, we'll go to the back to the start of your RT career then back to, to 1980 and how did the, the 1980 quite a big year for yeah a lot of we, we actually noticed this when we were doing our research during the week because who who else started? Ian in Dempsey eight? started in nineteen eighty, and so did Joe. No, not Joe. No, sorry, not Michael Joe. Lester started. Lester, yeah. Yeah. Well, in actually, 19, I would say they probably all started in seventy nine. Michael, anyway, um, because I started in seventy nine as a as a part time announcer, and then I came in full time in nineteen eighty. But nineteen seventy nine is when Two FM started. Okay. Oh, yeah, so it's yeah. in nineteen seventy nine, and Michael came in as one of the first sportscasters, yeah, yeah, yeah. and Ian would have been one of the first DJ. So mm. it's all around then, mm-hmm. nineteen seventy nine. Everything was happening. Yeah, yeah, everything was happening. Oh, mm. buzzing! I mean, I was only there a couple of weeks when when two uh, FM came on yeah. the air. That was huge excitement at the time in the radio. Did it ever? Did it ever tempt you? Go over. I'm no good. I'm. I, I have to. I have to have a script. Okay. I'm no good talking okay. off the top of my head. Really, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> so I, I just would never. I, I did it like I did it on Lyric FM. I did a program, but that's because with classical music you can kind of structure it, and you can. And I love doing that. I love weaving a script mm-hmm. around pieces of music and telling a story. But to do what Owen McDermott and those guys do, I couldn't. I just couldn't do it. That's that's not me. That's not my forte. So what was you? So you said you, you were part, working part time in seventy nine, then full time yeah. came in nineteen eighty. So what was the full time position then? That was as what? a radio announcer. Radio announcer, yeah. Grand, and so then, they don't they don't use them as much. I mean, the the announcer was in the studio all day, mm. and not, not we had ship system. There were six or seven of us at the time, and then part of those ships was presenting classical music concerts and presenting programs like I mentioned, like the mm. hospital's requests and the. And how long did that? Four years. Four years, yeah. and then what came after? News cat. I went the, over to the newsroom into in the newsroom. Yeah. So what what's it like when you get the call that you know you're going to be pretty much the face of RT? Well, you don't news. even you don't even realize it like that because it doesn't start like that. You start out doing headlines and early mornings and late nights right, on yeah. radio and you know you have to well, back then you had to work your way into it. Pay your dues. Pay your dues and, yeah. and get your knock up your experience and stuff like that. It doesn't mm-hmm. quite work like that anymore. It's different. It's just different now. So Eileen, obviously you mentioned there to start um, the international, you, you yourself actually served as the president of the International Association of European Journalists. What does that involve? That involves, so the Association of European Journalists is Europe-wide, except for Germany, because there was a split. Oh, as controversial. As in organisation. Before I got involved, I hastened to <laughs> in the 80s. In 88, I think they split. Um, so it's 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 Europe and beyond. Mm-hmm. It's kind of there's Finland and there's uh, Bulgaria, and so it's it's based around OECD rather than than actual gotcha. EU. Mm-hmm. So each country has what we call the Irish section, and the Irish section has always been quite strong. It was guys like Andy Shepherd and Mike Burns and um, you know uh, Val Dorgan and you know iconic names from old journalism, if you like. And when I was a young one, I was always interested in European affairs. I had spent, I had lived in France when I finished college. I went to France for a year. My thesis and for my French degree for the oral, you had to do a project, and my project was on a French presidential election. So I've always kind of been interested in stuff like that. And it was Una Claffey who was our political correspondent at the time. Um, she said to me, "You should join the AJ. You'd love it." And because I'm studio based a lot of the time, it, it, it's a great place. We get, we have kind of almost monthly lunches and various figures come in and speak. And then sometimes it's off the record. So you kind of get an insight and you're meeting other people then, yeah. and um, other journalists and stuff like that. Now it's harder, like at the time, I always went on my days off, stuff like that. Journalists would come, have lunch, go back to work. But the, the, the working day of a journalist now, between them trying to serve radio, television, online, everything else, they can't take two hours out for a lunch. So it doesn't work. You know, we find it more and more difficult to recruit younger members um, because A, they're either not willing to do it on a day off or B, but I did because I benefited an awful lot from mm-hmm. it. And I did benefit an awful lot from it. And therefore, I started going to the International Congress then and I got involved at that level. So first of all, you're on the board, and then you're vice president, and then you're president. Okay. And now I'm honorary president. 
Oh. Um, well, it's just I actually tried to do away with all that when I was president <laughs> <laughs> because you have nearly as many honorary presidents Eat and secretary it. generals as you have a board. You know, we tried to slim it down, um, but every country wants to have a stake and all that kind of thing. Anyway, there's all hell breaking loose again this year. It's an election year, so oh. fun and games. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's fascinating. Who's I was, the Irish representative? Uh, well, I would still be on oh, the board, to, so okay. I, I'm not on the board, but I'm on the Irish board, okay. so I will go. There'll be four or five of us going over to the Congress in December. Richard Moore is our chairman now at the moment, and um, Tim Tim Ryan is very involved. He's the treasurer. He's been there now as long as I have, so you know he's a, a long time. A while, yeah, mm-hmm. suffice to say. Um, but it's great. I was the first woman president, and you know, that doesn't mean that much in this country anymore, but my God, I remember... 2010, mm-hmm. I was elected, and um, the women, the women from Greece, the women from Turkey, the women from those kind of, oh, that was a huge achievement to have a woman president, so, yeah. It's a little, little one to take I on. absolutely, yeah. yeah and that's, that's been something that you've been very vocal and supportive of, is a more representation of women in kind of mainstream media and stuff like that. It must be great to see, like, the likes of yourself now on the 6 o'clock news with Katrina and Keelan, that's probably very encouraging to yourself and obviously younger women come through the ranks. Now in fairness I would have to say in RTE's defence it's never been a problem. Yeah. You know there have always been as long as I've been involved there's been as many women Mm -hmm. if not more than men and the same with reporters in the last 20-30 years Mm -hmm. there there, you know there was one stage there so knock it back a good bit like when you had Cathy Halloran and Orla Geeran and um, Orla O'Donnell when she started like there's always been a good cohort of women it's never been a problem in RTE. Mm -hmm. Very good, yeah. Um, and I, I suppose, obviously, Joanne Cantwell, Sunday oh, games, you know, yeah, and, yeah, and, 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 and uh, yeah. Ivan and yeah, Jackie, and as, Jackie well, as well, you know. So the kind of act, the RT has been kind of leading the way. Has was there ever a barrier because of that going past, going through in your career? Did you ever feel? No. 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 Never really had. No, you not in like terms of, of 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 career path. Mm. Money maybe, but not in terms of career path. Um, yes, yeah, so like over the course of your, your career, you've obviously covered like massive events like commemorations, state funerals, like, like so many different events I can't mean. Does anything stick out in the mind for one reason in particular over another, a favourite thing that you covered over the years? I suppose because it's been an evolving thing and you know what we call this rolling bulletin and again it couldn't have happened mm. when I started back in the day. So I suppose around 1998, which is Good Friday Agreement time and those uh, negotiations in the build up to that and I think it's the first time I sort of felt I have this cracked now I can do it you know um, I don't know what bulletin I think I was between bulletins I don't think I was on either the nine or the six but I was between but they were sticking me in doing this kind of stuff for the first time and I remember one afternoon we were on the air live Brian Dobson was in Belfast and I was in Dublin and I must have been co-presenting the six with Brian and we, it was all Belfast 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 and we came off the air maybe at 20 past five to go and do Newt and I remember um, having David Davin Power here, going on the air with something big and thinking, what, with nothing, you know, and realising, okay, you just need somebody to say something. And then what do you think of what he's just said? And mm-hmm. suddenly the conversation yeah, starts. Yeah. And you can get the whole thing going. Coming off the air at 20 past five and, and, and hearing, because you know, I don't know if you've done much broadcasting, but when you go in first, you've got three questions and you're going to ask those three questions. And it doesn't matter what is said back to you. You're not hearing a word of it. You're just asking those three questions. But suddenly hearing something and, and it clicking in my head, picking up on it and throwing it back at somebody. And I thought, I've cracked it. <laughs> and coming off the air at 20 past five, turning around and said, OK, Paul Cunningham is in Bosnia. You have to interview him about the war in Bosnia, Herzegovina. Switch and tack. And then coming back to be on the air again at six o'clock for the sixth one and just thinking, I think I have it. I think I'm in control here. Um, you've said that um, reporting and uh, delivering like the bad news, quote unquote, can leave its mark on you. Do you find it difficult to kind of leave work in work versus carrying it home? Which you yeah, possibly... I think it's actually only when you get home that it sort of dawns on you because when you're in the middle of it, you're sort of going on automatic and you just have to be, you, just have to to be it, yeah. you know, and you're kind of. <clears throat> who's the next person and what's the next question and who, what am I going to ask this person and I have to switch tack to talk to them because they're coming from a different... So you're not, you haven't time really to absorb it. Now, if you're sitting out in the newsroom and a story comes in and we, you hear us all going, you know, mm. something expletive. <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> you know? um, but you don't really, like, say it's a tragedy or something, an air crash or whatever. It's really only when you go home and get out of it. And maybe 
I go home and I watch Newsnight to find out what's really happening because you just don't have time to absorb it all sometimes when you're it must you're be so difficult though because like you know if you're say like a sports broadcaster you're going to follow sports religiously and you know but you, you know you'd be confined to a certain I suppose sports set as in you know your 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 range of sports but like if you're if you're going in for news you have to have a base in everything you do mm. and that my my shift to pattern has changed again this year I'm now I was doing five nights one week and four the next and now I'm doing seven on seven off okay. and Sharon has come up on the nine with me so <clears throat> I have to make a conscious effort on the week off mm -hmm. to keep up to still, because yeah. I could be doing an interview next week and you can look pretty stupid yeah, if, you, yeah. if you miss something. But I, uh, since the early days, and I was talking about my son, mm -hmm. my son earlier, um, when he was small, I started getting the paper delivered because I used to be on the one o'clock at that stage. So I'd get up at seven and I'd read the front page at least of the Irish Times before I'd start getting him up and out to school and blah, blah, blah. So at least I felt I was a bit ahead of it mm -hmm. and I still get the paper delivered so you? yeah so even would you, would you know that we, when we talk to joe duffy he he has two ipads on the go at all times no i prefer my newspaper you prefer physical, <laughs> yes. physical okay. paper. so i still do that and what's I, your paper choice the irish times okay so i would get up have a cup of coffee and scan the irish times and then i start my day so i kind of feel and i know even if i don't read an article that's why the paper is better i, it, I know it's there it's so there. there's an article there's oh finton must come back and read that mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. so i know what's there and i keep them yeah, yeah. um for a certain amount of time and you know we always tend to ask your guests when they're not doing the job that everyone knows them for how do they relax and it sounds like with yourself you're having to always keep up how do you relax when you're not i suppose i relax by walking by going to the gym by going to the theater and the concert hall which i can do now because i've seven days off as well as seven <laughs> days on and meeting friends and you know do you, going do to you the like the, the seven days on seven days i off? love it it's given me half my life back <laughs> <laughs> monday now monday afternoons is my movie day sneak up oh, to the omni or to cool and there's nobody there very there. good and I took my mother to see star is born the other day and you know so that mm. kind of thing i i wouldn't get to a movie because you know, if you're working every night, obviously, mm -hmm. then your weekends are spent trying to catch up. My mother is thankfully still alive, 90, a couple of weeks ago, yeah. And, you know, so you'd spend your weekend, but now I can take her out to lunch on a Monday, and she loves the carvery here in Parnell, so... Oh, often... Tom, my... <coughs> I was going to say, my, my Tom, my Tom. <laughs> <laughs> the man I live in digs with, uh, he yeah. goes, himself and his two sisters go on a Wednesday up to Parnell's. All right, mm -hmm. well, my mother loves, she loves mm -hmm. the carvery, so we often do that, and then over mm -hmm. to Kulak to the cinema, so it's great, you know, she'd be able to do that on a Monday, mm -hmm. and there's not too many people around, it's great. And are you a big fan of classical music, obviously from the radio gig? <coughs> <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. So would you, would you drive up here, listen to classical music at all? or the Lyric FM on? Yeah, absolutely, okay. yeah, yeah. Depends on the time of day and the mood I'm in, whether I swing between or Radio 1, whether I want Q102 is my sort of default if I'm kind of, the sun is shining and I'm bopping in the car. Oh, explain. And so at work, uh, I work in like a security monitoring centre and the radio's on and it's Q102. Right. And they just play Bruno Mars, Adele, Ed Sheeran, On Repeat. There's not much diversity. I paired perfect. I said about fifty times in one day. Like great song. <laughs> well, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be listening to it all day. Yeah. But to dip in and out, it's kind yeah, of yeah. I guess when, when it started, out, when it started, what was it called? It was called something else. Um, oh. We should know this. We studied like me media oh, history yeah, last, like last, it last semester. It was to do with it was looking back. So what was it called when it started? It was it was anyway. About, Cormac was only about five or six, and we, we were away. We were in Portugal. It started to say on the first of May, and I was all excited about it because it was going to be my kind of music. It has moved on. It used to be more 70s. Um, that'll just tell you. Uh, anyway, we, I remember we came home, we got into the car and we were going somewhere and there were a couple of songs on and I'm singing along and he says, Mum, do you know the words to every song? <laughs> I said, when it comes to this station, I'm going to know the words to Your every channel. song. You know, it was my channel. Now, it, it's more modern now. Mm. But anyway, yeah. Um, we obviously mentioned earlier on that you're dad was a GA correspondent you're obviously in your your Dublin half said much to Greg's disappointment today has is GA a big part of your life huge yes yeah. absolutely so you follow, huge. follow I, I assume you follow the footballers do you follow um hurlers yeah. the, the ladies game the whole lot, the whole this lot, is a big question lot. when you ask when you ask a dub are you a hurler or a footballer both mm, diplomatic come on no seriously I am <laughs> yeah I am seriously because my husband is from Galway mm -hmm. and he went he's from the Aran Islands actually and he went to boarding school in St. Charlotte's in Tume which is a famous footballing school, Jeez. but he actually and where played hurling. Michael Lester went as well. That's right. Oh, that's, Indeed, true, yeah. that's right. That's yeah. right. But Mathara played hurling for Jarlitz. And my son, 
we are now all members of Scully Cullen and Clontarf and my son though he's not playing at the moment. Is that Carl Farley? Yeah, and Ireland. One of our mates and yeah, one of our mates plays for TJ's son, yeah, he is, yeah. Yeah. Farley. You know? Of course I do. I'm in Scully Cullen. There you go. Um, there you go. but anyway, uh, Small world. Cormac. So it's slightly older than You would be slightly older than yeah. Connie. Yeah, Connor's in the same course as us. Yeah, so my my fella's twenty three, but he's now working weekends in a restaurant, so he's not playing at the moment, but his preference would be hurling. Okay. So yeah, we do. We travel to Dublin hurling matches as much as football. Though I'm a season ticket holder on the football, I have to say. Ooh. Well, this leads me into my little segment. Okay. So, sorry, I was telling my dad during or at the weekend. I was like, so yeah, we're doing Eileen Dunn during the week. Yeah, whatever. And he was like, do you know, do you know, her dad is from Clonusley, and I was like, what? Tony, shut up now. No, no, he's not. I was like, no, you're thinking of Claire Byrne. Who, but no, she's, yeah. she's actually Rose and she, Alice connections. She has, yeah. And Mount um, Rath, I think. Isn't and Mount Rath, Rath yeah. yeah. And um, so actually when I sat down and did my bit of research, I found out, but there's more. Apart from being a lovely leash man as well, he's also a Knock Beg alumni. That's right. Was he a boarder? He was. Oh, I was a boarder as well. Were you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is it still a boarding suit? No, I was the last year to boarding. Okay. Yeah. So um, I actually had to move for like my leave and search year. Right. Yeah, they told us when we were in... I think after Christmas the first year, brought us all in, sat us down and said, right. big announcement. Okay. But back in Daddy's Day, like it was, you were training for the seminary? Oh yeah. Oh, so that's... Yeah. Went back a good yeah, while. So, so. Uh, he actually spent a year in All Hallows yeah, then, yeah. but then left and the rest is history. Yes, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so where, so he, he was actually coming over from Clonus Lee. Yeah. To board. Yeah. And that, I think back then, what, it probably once every three weeks he would have probably came home. Yeah, well, not not every weekend. Yeah. It is now. And See, I, mean, I had the luxury. Like, it's, it's kind of, it's not that far from the conversation no, to, no. to not beg, you know. Um, I had the luxury of coming home every Friday, you All know, right. going back on a and Monday wait, morning. So you are you a leashman? I am, yeah. But, and what part of leash are you from? Ballyroan. Oh, right, okay. It's yeah. uh, just the like sky's over. The sky, the sky's over. Or yeah. Or yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, possibly yeah. Lovely yeah, leash. Yeah. yeah. See, yeah. Uh, we when this was a more of a radio show last year, uh, each week we used to take we used to put in a couple of songs and stuff, and uh, more often than not, mine was lovely leash. Um, so a god off the first oh, one. Okay, that's not nice. So in, <laughs> in 2014... Okay, you can put in, you know, the, the Coldplay one that they play now in Co Park all the time. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That in for me. Yeah, okay, right, we'll, we'll, we'll interest that. Um, in 2014, um, yourself and your mum actually took a trip down to Leash um, for the Mick Dunn handball um, Oh, cup. we did. You yeah. did? Yeah. Um, how was that? was that? How did that feel to come down, present a cup in honour of your dad, yourself and your mum to, to pass it over? Yeah, well, it was... It felt, Great, actually. Daddy, his passion was handball. Mm-hmm. So and camogie, was it? Well, a little bit, yeah. But, no, mm-hmm. but for him personally, because he played handball. Okay. And um, he fostered it. And when he went into RTE in the 70s, he started this with Michael O'Carroll, the producer. They started this top ace tournament, mm-hmm. which was a televised handball tournament, which had never been done before. Blah, 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 blah. So he, he would be kind of a champion of the handball fraternity. And... You, you know, we obviously don't know them. They don't have the same profile as the hurlers and mm-hmm. footballers and all the rest of it. But um, when he died, the number of handball people that came to the funeral was unbelievable. Yeah. People walking up and saying, hi, I'm so-and-so. And you'd say, oh, yeah, I know the name. I know the mm-hmm. name. But, so the big nights were, we used to be the, the night before the two All-Ireland finals. They'd have their singles finals and their doubles finals down in Crow Park. And he would be down and he'd be emceeing them. Guess where I'm going on Saturday? Where? emceeing the double oh. finals so I still do it okay. over the years I've done it now they've did you ever play handball yourself? no yeah. or any like uh, camogie no. Like football? no, no. <laughs> just, a, just an avid fan you were never pushed in that direction at all it was like nudge. no camogie in Manor House when I was there oh, okay. Maria O'Kelly um, started it when she came as a teacher so my younger sister played camogie alright but I played a bit of basketball, that's all, basketball. really. I have a bad eye, that was always my excuse. Mm. I'm a better single, I'm not a great team. I love watching, I'll watch any sport, but I'm not a great team sport person, mm. you know. It's a favourite sport. Dav has a similar problem, he's just horribly uncoordinated, it's just mainly his real <laughs> I, uh, problem. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a sportsman. I wouldn't have that problem. At least he has but. knees to be able to run onto a fish. Okay. <laughs> That's a low blow. <laughs> I don't care if you've got company and this has been recorded. That was a low blow. I, I I have a bad knee. Mm. It's it won't be the best now. It's not the healthiest. He's making thing. a comeback later on in the year. We hope we're we're, we're myself, planning one. Myself and Greg are head and deputy head respectively. Arnold, well, he's the head on the deputy head of sport for DCUFM here, and uh, every year towards the end of the second semester, uh, for the past I think four or five years they've had the Billow Cup, the Billow Hurley Cup, 
um, and it's basically DCUFM against the College View, which is the paper here. Okay. Um, and technically, by the letter of the law, Greg is now captain as head of sport, so he is going to try and make some way of an appearance for this year. Yeah. And is it football? Soccer. Uh, soccer. soccer. So, um, yeah, I have to do a bit of serious rehab. Mm. Show those college view lads mm. who's boss. Right. Film a load of like Rocky style montages of you getting back into Yeah, I feel I, I feel like this could be like documentary of the year. Uh, yeah. I can see it. It could be in this media's next year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, action replay. Oh no, that was a, that was a big question. No, they won this media. Was it this media? Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't remember what it's for now. Yeah. But uh, the our action replay is the um the biweekly sports show that myself and Greg now present as head okay. and deputy head, okay. and it won it won I think. I can't remember what it was. One a, a an yeah. award at the Smedias right. yeah. um, last year. So big boots to Yeah, to we fill. have a lot of big boots to fill, yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, Ian, if you recently, you've said about the dumbing down of news media, that people, you know, you, they hear about all the depressing stuff on the news and they really want something lighter. Why do you think that is these days? Uh, why is it happening or why are we yeah. tolerating it? Yeah. Because that's two both. different things. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know why it's happening because I kind of think, well, I... T- Oh, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's just the whole, it's everything, you know. Mm. I mean, I, I, I think it's, I, I blame us. I blame us as parents for a lot of it. I, the, the snowflake generation, and I hate using that term, and I don't, I don't mean it, you know, but there is an element of we haven't prepared our kids. Shit happens, am I allowed to say that? Yeah. You know, life is tough. We get the little explicit. Yeah, we yeah. have the little <laughs> okay. in the corner. Of so, thing, um, yeah. life is tough, and I don't think we're preparing our kids properly. Keep co- we have them too cosseted and told everything will be hunky dory mm. and you're wonderful and you're marvellous. You know, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Mm. And mm. unfortunately, there is a lot of suicide in this country, and there is a lot of depression, and there is a lot of stuff. And I just think we're not giving people the coping skills, and part of that is. So then they, they hit something that they don't like and they see tragedy somewhere. Oh, I don't want to know about that. Mm-hmm. Well, I think a, a lot of it as well is just there's so much media now. It's easy to distract yourself when you see a bad news story with something else with Twitter, or Facebook, Snapchat. And then also, before you'd go on, you'd see the telly at six o'clock or the radio at whatever time. Now you can see Facebook news story, news story, sometimes fake news stories, Twitter news stories, news stories. I think people are, there's an influx of it and people just kind of they want to decompress from it, I think. That's what I see in it anyway. Yeah, but uh, should we be, should we be going down to that level? If you know what I mean, mm. because uh, I don't know. I like we always had maybe a, a little funny story at the end of a bullet. You didn't always have it. If it happened, yeah. you had it. But now it's almost obligatory to have mm. the funny part. Yeah. You know? at the end, and yeah. they just the the interviews. Oh, I, and it's not only in RT. It's happening everywhere. You know, and it's uh, and it's also dropping standards and not being careless and. Um, the, the sub-editor level seems to be being pulled out like I, I, I know my, some of my newspaper colleagues go ballistic so you're covering a news conference today and you say the Taoiseach said this afternoon blah 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 and I pick up the Irish Times tomorrow and it's still saying the Taoiseach said this afternoon there's nobody coming along to put it back into the past say yesterday you know mm. um, that kind of where journalists are now inputting directly there's no third eye yeah. Um, there are fewer people, there are cutbacks, there are the, the potential for disaster, I think, too, is, is far more um, out there, you know. Um, and have you noticed a big change from, say, your generation of uh, journalists and presenters to now? Is there a big difference from, let's say, Katrina Perry or John Catwell in how they present the news or how they look at the world? There is, well, uh, the biggest thing I'd say is, I'm not, not naming anyone specifically, but people mm. of that generation, their grammar. Mm. is appalling because you're not being taught mm-hmm. you're not being taught grammar at school were you taught grammar at school? Uh, well I, I, I would consider myself quite good in that I, I think I have quite good grammar but um, it probably wasn't something that there was an over emphasis no. on yeah. certainly so like tenses mm. I get I go bananas but I just do it instinctively now so whatever yeah. tense the sentence starts in I'll follow it through so many people saying why are you or why are you possibly or they don't, know, they don't know the difference. Like, no, they don't know the difference. The or thing. people will say, the Taoiseach said he will go. That's bad grammar. Mm. The Taoiseach says he will go. The Taoiseach said he would go. Now, do you hear the teacher coming out of me? <laughs> but, so uh, whatever, whatever it way it's fit. given to me, yeah. I just do it instinctively now. So if, if the sentence start, the Taoiseach says, I will continue with the present and the future. If it's in the past, I'll go that way. But that, that's, the, that's the big thing. And when I point that out... I have one wonderful guy and he's now been promoted and all the rest of it and I pointed this out and he said I didn't actually know that. Mm-hmm. So I thought 
oh, oh, no, I'm in trouble. And of course, there's all the texting language and slang and stuff like that. And probably adds to it. All you right. know. Um, one person that obviously you probably worked as closely with as anybody over the course of your career is um, Brian Dobson, mm -hmm. um, who's obviously now uh, retired. What was he he's like? Not. Is he? Well, sorry, well, retired from the the He'll be out yeah. now for the presidential, I think. I think, is he doing it? He did the budget anyway. You know, he does the big, mm -hmm. still does some of the big events on telly. And how was your relationship with him? Was an instant like rapport doing the news? Um, well, I never really worked with him as a partner okay you know so i started the the, the six one with sean dignan mm -hmm. we were the first presenters of the six one then i would have worked with eamon lawler uh, but with brian uh, we were never a partnership okay. i would have been in deputizing for uno hagen or Anne doyle or whoever yeah, yeah. with him but i never actually worked or okay. sharon he and sharon now they worked as the partnership for the mm -hmm. last number of years and they would they would have been very close as you would be if you're with somebody every day um, I mean, Brian would be a friend of mine and we would yeah. socialise together and that, but I wouldn't have worked with him that closely. Um, Actually, another thing I wanted to ask, what time slot of the news did you prefer doing? Was there anyone that was better than the other? Oh, mm -hmm. I like the nine, because the nine is more, the, the six is a big beast, as we call mm. it, you know, it's kind of, it's, and by, by the nine you have, because you'll hear me saying again, you have time to put a structure on it, and yeah. kind of, it's, it's a summary of the day. Um, I kind of even if I'm at home, really more I'd watch content. the nine rather than the six because it gives you the summary of the whole yeah, day. Yeah, you might. Yeah, you might have more content to work with at the nine versus probably like the one o'clock when the day is. Oh, the one o'clock can be, but the one o'clock is a great learning place though because yeah. things are coming in at the very last minute, and mm. it can be switching from here to there all how over the place. So stuff, how to yeah. adapt and stuff. Yeah. Um. Obviously, we've been at this kind of interview stuff for the past probably what five or six months now. Super long time in comparison to Eileen's 34 years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. we're, <laughs> we're, on, we're only... Go on, just put it in perspective for yeah, us. We're, <laughs> we're, uh, we're only starting out. Um, but I'm sure you've conducted many, uh, many memorable interviews over the years. Is there any ones in particular that will stand out as uh, memorable or <laughs> the opposite? No, I, okay, so there'll be a few. So the, there's the news interview, and if you're doing an interview on the nine o'clock news, it's usually the correspondence or on maybe budget night, it's the Taoiseach, and it's never more than three or four minutes. So it's kind of fairly constrained. Uh, the very first interview I ever did, it was for the six one and it was with Gay Byrne. Oh, wow. When his book came out and we pre-recorded it on a Friday afternoon and I think it lasted about seven and a half minutes. Now, I don't know how many minutes of it were broadcast. It was edited. I was petrified. <laughs> Just <laughs> petrified. And I'm sure I was truly awful. But the only thing was Gay Byrne always liked me and he still does. He used to always talk about my hands and my fingers, my piano, <laughs> my piano player's hands he used to talk about. So he always had time for me. And I'd say it's the only reason he agreed to do it, apart from the fact that he wanted publicity for his book. <laughs> but you know, I mean, he could quite easily have said, don't be putting that young one in front of yeah. me, like get me Brian Dobson or Sean Dagnan or somebody. Yeah. He's gay seemed to have a bit of a soft spot for the newbies when they, when they came through. Yeah, no, he did again, you know, but yeah, he, he actually, anyway, so I just remember that because I was petrified. I don't ask me what I asked him because I haven't a clue. Um, but then apart from that, um, I, I suppose my, f again, that all around that sort of the, the Good Friday agreement, that's when I really got stuck into those kind of rolling bulletin things and, um, you know, going on the air with breaking stories and stuff like that. So I remember all of that. But then I also did a program for a couple of years called The God Slot on radio on a Friday night, oh, which yeah. was about all religions and none. But that gave me the chance to get into longer kind of interviews. And probably the most memorable interview then that I've done, to cut a long story short, was with Tommy Reichenthal. If, I don't know if you know him, he's the Holocaust survivor. Oh. who's now in his 80s and he didn't speak about it for years and years and years and suddenly has come out and has written a book and then out from that book somebody in Limerick heard the interview on radio blah 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 he's gone back and he's made documentaries now and gone back to where he was and the camp he was in and all that kind of thing and he, the book is amazing he was only a child um, but the interview was even more amazing just sitting with him and he actually broke down in the middle of the interview because he was remembering that there were no birds in Bergen Belsen. And that, mm. for some reason, that just sparked so, him off. Mm. And that's the one that stays with me. That's uh, the was one it an hour long? Few or it was about a half an hour. Half an hour. Yeah. That's kind of, we've, I think we've talked about this before, like we're thrilled with all the, the big names we're getting on. Like we feel very lucky, but we are looking for that one of those kind of interviews mm. where um, it might not necessarily be a big name, but it's the story that's the kill. Like our, a, a friend of ours, um, 
Gavin, or well, it was Gavin Casey. Was it Gavin Casey's story at the which about the boxing? The boxing. Yeah, it was Gavin Casey. There was an amateur boxer from Balbriggan who had sparred with Floyd Mayweather, and that was, like he had kind of got a bit of notoriety for that. But he had gone through uh, serious depression and drug addiction, and um, that story was something that kind of springboarded his career. And I feel like we're kind of looking for that interview mm-hmm. now. Like the mm-hmm. big names are great, but is that one kind of niche mm-hmm. interview that really? Yeah, yeah. It's Joe over. Broly. Well, we heard about Joe Broly the other week. The story about Joe Broly from Connors from Connors Yeah. Oh yeah. Stories like that. Story about Joe Broly. Oh, it's from Can we do it uh, justice? Uh, basically, uh, we had. Uh, do you know Connor Sketches, the impressionist? Yet? Yeah. Um. He we had him on last week, and he was telling the story about how. Um, Good, he's good mates with Joe. Yeah, mm. yeah just through sure. doing the impressions on yes. him, they've nearly become best friends. And uh, they were out in Dublin one evening, and they were just leaving a pub to go on to another one, I believe. And um, they were walking down. It was it was around Christmas time, and uh, Joe was after doing some gig with someone else from RT over in the states. Got a nice pay packet for it. Came back, they went out on the beer, and uh, they were walking out of some pub, and um, Joe just kind of wandered off, and. Uh, Kind of, Connor left him for a couple of minutes or whatever and they went on they got to wherever they were going and he said to him uh, who, who was your one like and he said oh that's just Anne and kind of, he'd gone down there was this alleyway down the street and there was this homeless woman obviously like sitting down and Joe uh, kind of bends over and starts chatting to her and Connor's like what's this about but he, he doesn't question it Late, later in the evening he's like Joe what was all that about what you want and he's like oh that's just um, that's just Anne Anne what do you mean and, like that's just Anne he's like yeah yeah I went for dinner with her last last week and Connor's like, you went for dinner, but like, like she's homeless, Joe. Like, how would that come about? And basically, what happened was Joe took the money from this job that he did over in America, went into the Shelburne, she was mm-hmm. yeah. put the money behind the bar, and bought twenty seven homeless people in for a di- a, a meal Perfect. in in the Shelburne. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it is like like I've said, that is that those kind yeah. of stories yeah. gems like that, that have the the effect. That's what we're looking yeah. for. Um, like we when that's we, what, we talked about like journalists getting you know, their, their interview that sticks with them and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And like, I think, and I, I know for, for me, I did, the, I was working at the Leash County final, football final a fortnight ago and um, I've been working for a newspaper in Leash for a couple of years but uh, Cara Healy, he's a dual star with Leash uh, for years. He did his crew shit in, in the first uh, round of the club championship last year. Um, he actually lives and works over in London, flies home every weekend for training and stuff. Um. Basically, he'd done his cruise, he'd came back, he'd won the senior A hurling the week before, and he'd won his 12th senior county football final. And uh, I went up to him, after, I was doing interviews, and I went up to him at the final whistle, and uh, he started breaking down crying the whole way through. His mum came over, just took off again. And uh, just for me on a personal level, I've seen him grow, like as I've been growing sure. up, you yeah. know, and stuff. Yeah. And uh, really stuck with me, it was, it, was really, it was a really nice interview. He said it was the too sweet, like, he's won a lot, he's minor all Ireland, he's got a couple of things. And he said it was just the two sweetest medals he's ever had. But you know? sure, look at the likes of Colin Cooper. Yeah. All the All Ireland mm-hmm. medals and All Stars and everything. And, the and only we looked it up yesterday. Five. Eight. Oh, yeah, five. Yeah, five. Yeah, yeah. And um, eight All Stars. Eight All. Yeah. Which your dad will know. Sorry. And that'll come to that in yeah. a minute. Um, <laughs> but the sweetest one for him was when he went back after retiring yeah. and went out and won a club medal. Yeah. That was the one yeah, that meant exactly. more to him. Yeah. And the photograph of himself with Patrick Shea is another gentleman, former mm-hmm. Ke- Kerry trainer. Who was training mm-hmm. his team that year? You know, where he jumped up into each other's yeah. arms. You know, that was the brilliant, best photograph. All Stars, yes, my father was one of the founders of the All Stars, mm-hmm. and actually, the 50th anniversary of the All Stars coming up in 2020. Mm-hmm. And myself and my sister are doing the book. Oh, very nice. Because when we handed over Daddy's archive to the GAA, he was, as I said, meticulous, so he kept these massive record books. Mm-hmm. And you'd have all the journalists used to ring our house, Lily, my mother, will you run up and check? I need, will you run up and check? <laughs> And um, so all that stuff has gone into the GA Museum, but they didn't take the handball stuff and they didn't take the all-star stuff. They probably didn't even realise it was there. Mm-hmm. We didn't until a year or two ago. Okay. And we discovered this treasure trove. He was also the first secretary of the scheme. Oh. So there are all these early letters and things from Jack Lynch and letters to nominees and trying to get sponsors and all that kind of thing. So we have all this. Wow. Stuff. We're doing a little book. Oh, great. Is that another exclusive, guys? That new is information it, is it? Well, it's beginning to get out there now because it's. We'll put it out there. I'm taking it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't care if it's factual or not. So um, yeah, it's um, going to be a work in progress. That sounds great. Yeah. I mean, I have a question for you. Do you use social media? No. 
No, good. I follow Twitter. I follow on Twitter. Okay. But I don't tweet and I don't yeah, do Facebook at all. That's did, you, did you ever and then just decide it wasn't for you or no, is it just something that... I, I saw too many people getting into too much trouble. Facebook, I don't want to know about. Okay. Twitter, I even, I even find myself spending far too much time instead of reading a book, I'm on Twitter, you know. Mm -hmm. But I kind of follow things like I have Vanity Fair on it, I have the Boston Globe, I have Le Mans, I have, mm -hmm. you know, so it keeps me in, loop. Uh, in the loop yeah. as well. And then my brother-in-law gave me very sound advice, because the problem I have with it is that you're following all the people that you like, so you're only getting one view of an the An echo world. chamber. It's an echo chamber. So my brother-in-law said to me, put up two people that you can't stand. Sorry. Who did you pick? I know, I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Piers Morgan is definitely one of them. <laughs> he's not, actually, because he's an Arsenal fan. Oh, uh, <laughs> what about Trump? Um, Surely. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, he's there. He, I yeah. don't need to put him up, because people yeah, are there. Yeah. You know, I don't need to follow him. Um, but no, I, so I do have a couple of people and you see they then bring with them all, mm. the, people, all the other people that you can't yeah, stand yeah, so yeah. I kind of think I get a balanced view but I have no interest in tweeting and many of my colleagues have had to have done it and have had to stop and yeah, got into yeah. trouble oh I couldn't be fucked yeah it's very, it's very important now like any employee of any kind of media company they have to say in their bio yeah. views are my own views are yeah. that just, just but even like I, I would say you're not allowed to have views of your own in public Yes, wait till I retire, then I'll tell you what I mean. Yes, but you have to be in person. You, know, you have to be. Well, I'm going news, in there. Yeah. You don't know if I, I might have to interview you tonight and you tomorrow mm -hmm. night on opposing sides of something. I can't make my, my feelings known publicly. And I would be very, as a newscaster, I would be very strong about that. You should never know how I feel about anything. Mm -hmm. You might think you do, and people do think they do, but mm -hmm. they don't. So do you find, follow any political alignments or...? No, I, of course I do, but I'm not telling you about it. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's but, fine. You know, because I can't. That's fair enough. You know, yeah, I don't yeah. think I should. You know, I, it's, it's mm. uh, because it, it immediately damages my credibility mm. if I'm seen to be, you know. Especially yeah. now, like if... You go down to Leash and ask them and they, 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 you'll, get, <laughs> you'll get 20 different answers, you know. But the way things spread now, you, if, if you find out one thing from listening to this, it spreads to another person, it sure. goes across the whole yeah. Twitter echo chamber. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, should we get... We'll just... Do you want to play a bit of... Oh, yeah, we'll play a bit of... Two Truth. Uh, oh, yeah, all right, we'll start with that one. We do Truth, yeah. yeah. So we were trying to, you know... Uh, Spice light, it up lighten a bit. The tone. We obviously had quite a, an in-depth discussion about your career, so we'll lighten the tone. We'll, we'll play Two Truths, One Bring Lie. Bring it down are to you, our level, basically. Okay. Are you familiar with this game, Two Truths, One Lie? No. So we're going to give you three statements. Okay. Two of them are going to be true, one of them's going to be a lie. Okay. And so you, have you. To, you have to figure out which one okay. is the lie. Right. So... Um, what do I get if I get it right? Or wrong. And the sa <laughs> get a pen. Yeah, I'm very fond of this pen. <laughs> right, what, what, what ones do we have down? Okay, so, um, okay. yeah, so my statement is I have been punched in the stomach by a kangaroo. That's the statement. So, um, Where did this, am I allowed to ask questions about it? Um, no, no. Okay. Right. Gavin? Actually, she is allowed. That's actually true. I'm fairly sure, isn't it? No, it's not. Is it not? Okay, no. grand. Okay. My statement is that I have relations in Canada. Hmm. Um, my statement is I'm 25 years old. Hmm. That's not true. Um, so you're saying that are two, are, are well, true? One of them, uh, two, no, it's two, 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 two truths, one lie. Okay, well then you two are true. Yeah. Okay, wrong. 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 Okay. Because I, 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 twenty five. Yeah. But you said Connor was in your class. You in your. Oh, yeah, you no, I'm, a, I'm a mature student. Oh, okay, okay. Thanks for highlighting that. <laughs> 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 All right, rub it in. It's not something I'm getting on a daily basis. I thought I said I'm ahead of the posse here. <laughs> <laughs> now, who do you think is the lie between the two of us then? Why? I thought they were supposed to be both it's, true. Yeah, then. No, two he, he's true. So there's still one more oh, truth. Oh yeah. Right to identify. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, it's you know that's probably too obvious that you have can that you have relatives in Canada, so I'll go with you. Probably got punched. I've in been punched in the stomach. Now tell me. Really. Now answer the question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Um. Yeah. We went to on a um a school trip in first class to photo wildlife um down Cork, and basically you basically go as a huge class group. You're basically just walking through the park. They have a designated path, and you just obviously just go in and see all the animals, or whatever. But um, there were kangaroos kind of floating about, like fairly seamlessly. Like, there was like um, zookeepers around, so it was safe. But I had gotten towards the back of the, the group and I saw a kid about probably about a similar age, maybe a little bit older, with this baby kangaroo. What I didn't see was the zookeeper obviously making sure that everything was safe and like the parent there and everything. 
So in my young mind, I was like, I want to do that. So I walk up to, I'm not going to say adult, because I, don't, I think an adult would have been a lot bigger, but a rather larger size kangaroo, and try to reach out my hand to try and like pet it or whatever. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it just gave me a dig in the stomach. But the other thing about that is when you said it, so I'm immediately thinking, I'm trying to, in my mind, okay, so was he on Australia? Did he do a gap mm, year? Was yeah. he in New Zealand? Where was he? Where did it happen? Photo Island is the last yeah. year. I would have talked. I was a young and fat in photo, the stomach photo, by photo a kangaroo. Life down in Didn't that. hit you half hard enough. What? <laughs> Didn't hit you hard enough. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Uh, I mean, tell us, tea or coffee? Coffee. Coffee. How do you take your coffee? Uh, depends. I'm, I'm I'm getting into the flat white now lately. Oh, okay. It is a, it's it's an upward trend. I think the flat white. But yeah. it's also uh, because I was having coffee with a friend yesterday, as it happens, and she said I was just looking up at the calorie count, and the flat white had only sixty nine calories, and the latte had a hundred and something. Really? So, and it I didn't really because it 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 looks like a latte. Yeah, like mm. it's pretty much the same. Okay. It's pretty, pretty much the same as a latte. Because it does come in those smaller cups. As it well. is smaller. Yeah. Now, so that's that's yeah. probably a. Because it's just like the well. frothy kind of head. It, it does have the frothy, but it's yeah. not as thick as yeah. the uh, cappuccino. So it's a kind of a nice compromise. Mm. So that's where I'm going at the moment when I'm out. Okay. But when I'm home, just your jar of instant grand first thing in the morning. Yeah, down little spoon, good okay. eat spoon actually. Oh. And it's mm. fine. The uh, get that extra kick. Next, the espresso, but. It's out of a jar. Okay. Don't, have, yeah, don't yeah. have the machines. And that's the one I like. That's the one I like at the moment. Let's see. Um, your ideal Saturday night. All things going to plan. Everything's within your control. You completely dictate the environment. What do you do? Depends on the time of the year. Because at the moment... It's, that's up to uh, you too. Uh, well, if it's now, mm -hmm. strictly. Oh. My ma my you're a you're a woman after my mother's own heart. I have to say, yeah, that would Don't probably annoy me. And I have I have I have didn't get a chance to see last Saturday's yet because I was out to dinner. If it's not strictly time, then dinner with friends and preferably a nice Italian. And my favorite at the moment is Bar Italia in uh, on the Keys. Okay. And a nice glass of Vermentino. Vermentino. Yes. Oh, geez, you're gonna have to elaborate on that one for me. Vermentino is Ita white Italian wine, but it's okay. not. It's you don't get it everywhere, but they do have it in Bar Italia. Okay. And I was in Liverpool with my son, the Arsenal fan, mm -hmm. and it was our first time going to an Arsenal match, but it was Arsenal versus Liverpool in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. Oh, and we went they got the hammered. And the boat. No, there was a draw. Actually, thanks oh, okay. to God, because someone was only about eleven or twelve. Okay, if they had been beaten, it would have been just a disaster. Oh, yeah. But we went on the boat. So you get on, you get on the bus, yeah, and Storm Street, yeah. and the bus goes on. Oh, listen, we had such crack. I think he was about twelve. It was only the two of us. We went about five. You know, getting five o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. We did. He had his Arsenal jersey on under a black jacket, and nobody knew he was an Arsenal fan except the bus driver, and I. I was just dressed normally, mm -hmm. in red and white, so that could have been anything. Um, but the Liverpool, we had such crack. We didn't stop laughing from the time we got on that bus until the time we got off it at Anfield. And there were the guys were on the phones to different fellas who had maybe crossed over the night before, and they were. Where were they going to meet in the pubs in round Liverpool? And oh, it was just, it was a panic. You know, it was an absolute panic. And there were two Chinese women on the bus. Oh, clueless. Don't ask me why they were on it. But anyway, um, sweet and sour, the boys. <laughs> the boys christened them sweet and sour. And they didn't turn up for the return journey home. They didn't turn up? They didn't turn up. Now, when we were going over, we drove down everything. And the bus driver eventually said, guys, I know the email said 11 o'clock for the off to come back. But I think we should meet at 10, given mm. the traffic, and we want to make the boat, blah, blah, blah. So we turned up at 10, most of them plastered. And, but in, in, great, in, great, in even better form now. Mm. And, but no sign of the two women. Mm. So the bus driver, in fairness to him, he says, I can't, maybe they didn't understand yeah, what I was yeah, saying. Yeah. They're going by the email. He waited until 11. They never showed up. Anyway, we all figured they were using, they're not coming. They've come over to find two husbands. They're not coming <laughs> back. But this was their way into England. Yeah, and maybe yeah. it was. Get on a bus in Dublin and just sail in. No customs, no nothing. Yeah, you know. Yeah. However, anyway, the two women disappeared into the ether and home we had to come. When we were in Liverpool after a long day, so we're up since five o'clock in the morning, and Cormac was just getting that stage where it didn't have to be McDonald's anymore. So <laughs> great, hey, so he's into pizza now and getting into Italian. So we got eventually got a taxi out of Anfield into the centre. We had about three hours. So I said to the taxi man, bring me to a nice Italian restaurant, please. We're tired and we're hungry. And he said, not only will I bring you to a nice Italian restaurant, I'll bring you to the best Italian ah, restaurant. Ah, well, they're all going to say that, like, you know. But I think he did, in fairness. It was absolutely <laughs> gorgeous. 
and um, two of the Liverpool players, Skirtle and somebody else, came in after oh, we were no there. Way. So I think it was okay. It was but anyway, probably okay. The waiter came over and I had Cormac at this stage. I always said to him, try it, try it. If you don't like it, you know. So we were getting this starter thing. It was an amalgam of prawns and all kinds of things. So that was coming. And I said, and I want a nice glass of Pinot Grigio. And he almost, Pinot Grigio, he almost spat at me. <laughs> you don't want Pinot Grigio. That's muck. And I said, okay, do I not? So what do I want? And he said, you want a nice glass of Vermentino. So he introduced me to it. And it is it's kind of an unusual taste now. It's an acquired taste, but it's... it's, yeah. it's so that trip over to Liverpool on the boat is rough. I've done it for a couple of I've games. I've done it for a couple of And going to Manchester as yeah. well. Uh, particularly, on, particularly on the boat. Oh, I, I get awful seasick. Do you? Yeah. I told you about the time that... Um, so we went with school, like, and obviously being young lads and young and mischievous and whatever, we stopped in you know that place in Wales with the longest name. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, I don't know how or why or what the circumstances were, but we ended up like wandering around. You know, where there's like a little mini shopping centre. You think it's gonna, it's really kind of shit. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. But we were in the pub that's just down from it as well. I don't know why, but we were in the bathroom and you know the 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 thingies, the machines, and somebody bought herbal Viagra. Right, there was there was a lot of there was motive behind this I think, and um, so one of the lads came up, you know, when we were on the boat then, it's like, oh my stomach, uh. anybody have like you know seasickness tablets? Oh, oh, no. oh herbal oh, bag, and he it. sat, he sat just with like his jacket on his lap for like three hours on the ferry. Was that with so um? Worked. Oh, it works. Yeah. Was that with knockback? <laughs> was that with knockback? Huh? Knock uh, it was actually. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Nick Dunn wouldn't have done something no, like that. No, now he, he would have been. He, but was he wouldn't have been. He wouldn't have been traveling in those days. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, the thing that struck me because it was my first soccer match mm-hmm. was the level. When you're used to, you know, fans mingling, leash fans. Oh, the yeah. separation, oh, yeah. And the, but the coarseness of the... The mm. language. The language, but not only the language, <laughs> yeah, but just yeah. the, 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 the vile, the hatred, the, vicious, the, the yeah. viciousness of it, you yeah. know. I suppose because, like, they are separated, they have a bit of more license to kind of hurl the verbal yeah. abuse because the stewards get in the no, way. No, but you, when you're in... coming out then, who's, who's the Liverpool fan? Who's been to Anfield? I'm a, I'm a Liverpool fan. Yeah. So, you know, when you're walking up then, yeah, you know all the all the fans then meet, mm. and I, no. it was actually a bit scary now. I ha- I haven't been to any big rivalries now. Unfortunately, I've been I went to Europe. Hey, you were at the Leinster final, at least you <laughs> <laughs> I meant for Liverpool. Uh, yeah, no, I haven't been at any big rivalries for Liverpool. I went to see them play Stoke in the Premier League with my dad a few years ago, and I got to see them play Young Boys of Burn in the Europa League. So they were rather tamer audiences. Right. Um, I, think. I just the venom of it just really got out to yeah. actually when I went over with my dad we did meet um, Pepe Reina in Manchester oh, Airport okay. as we were flying back and it was like it was like Manchester Airport would he not just go to um, to John Lennon but uh, yeah, he was going back for international break and got a photo with him my Oops. face went bright red like I have a photo yeah. of it at home and I'm literally like a tomato because I'm Oops. just so, like, <laughs> okay my one of those is we were in New York this year my cousin got married and we were all over for the wedding and we went to the US Open to the tennis on the Monday mm. Labour Day and I very smartly booked the Hilton Hotel right beside it, 10 minutes away, and now it was 90-something degrees and 65% humidity or, you know, whatever. Mm. Poor Federer couldn't hack it and was beaten. We were distraught. Federer is my big hero. Okay. But in the hotel, Hilton, we could go back, have a shower, have a snooze, cool down, and back for the night session to watch Federer, which is what we did. Next morning, I'm coming down in the lift. We're on the fifth floor, third floor, door opens, this guy gets in. Now all the stars, because we saw them a few years ago, stay in Manhattan and they're brought out in limousines and everything. Who gets into I said, Mats Verlander. You're probably too young to know who Mats Verlander is. I, I recognise the name. He was a Swedish, uh, one Wimbledon, yeah. you know, oh, three, I think okay. he has three Grand Slams. The name does ring a bell. But he or, presents yeah. this programme now in Eurosport, Game, Chet and Mats. So with this it's a on the Eurosport coverage mm-hmm. they do this kind of chat roundup of the day and stuff like that anyway Mats Philander here he was with his little backpack because he's now a working journal so he's walking as we were from the Hilton over to the tennis so that was my but I had actually seen him goal um, John O'Shea used to organize a goal challenge and he actually had him in Dublin I actually saw him play in Dublin but I forgot about that when I met him right. my own was a uh, Ross Monley not well, yeah. Hey, he could make. He hero. could make. Uh, going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sixteen no, we, seasons. We interviewed him last year. Um, for, for me on a personal level, it was a little. Yeah. But uh, nice guy. no, uh, Leinster semi final last year. Um, Leisha Carlo. It was it was my first time in the press box in Croke Park. All right. After I've been I've been a freelancer for a couple of years, 
and I was a little one, but like I was there and I was taking my seat and I was, you know, taking it all in. Yeah. And uh, next thing, me Hall and Murray Hurt are just yeah, walking out. And I'm like, yeah. and he's sitting down like a couple of seats away from me, and I'm like, how did you a strong cup of tea? Strong cup of tea. Hang sandwiches in, in Hang hand. Hang sandwiches. Yeah. yeah, but see, in, like the press box in Coke Park, like you're well looked after. You are well It's not like Moore Park now when you go in and, you know. I went to Middleton with Daddy once and I was still on radio, I think. So um, I was just starting out in television, so I wouldn't have been recognisable. Like it was just, you know. Mm. I, it was, I think it was, I think it was 1984-85 because Cork had won the All-Ireland and so John Middleton, 1985 must have been, so that means John Middleton was, no, I'm getting it the wrong way around. Uh, yes, Cork had won the All-Ireland, John Middleton was the captain, John Fenton was the captain and his club is Middleton, so Middleton got the first league match of mm -hmm. the next season, whatever. So we were there. Uh, I was there with Daddy in the press box. Daddy used to have somebody with him to take notes, so it was either my mother or one of us. I okay. had two sisters, so we... Who I generally got the gig? Me. Okay. <laughs> because I was the eldest <laughs> and the one with the most interest. So I would always say, we didn't go on Sunday drives up to the Dublin mountains, but I could name you any GAA <laughs> around the country. That's where I spent my childhood and my life. Um, so anyway, as I say, I'm now in my 20s and I've just started an RT. But somebody coming in like that at half time, Mick, you know, what, how, what way do you like your tea? Mm -hmm. And what will your lady friend have? <laughs> <laughs> we used to get a great kick, he'd say no. Did you, do you have a starstruck I don't really moment, know. No? Unfortunately not. But have you ever met anybody, well, obviously we've been doing big names, but anybody on a personal level that you were kind of like, well. Really not, no. no. Um, I suppose you are from Cabin. don't meet your heroes, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like Sean, uh, Sean e. Quinn is probably... Sean Quinn is personal hero. Right? <laughs> yeah. Sean Quinn, yeah. He is beside the sleeve. Speaking like of that, oh, right. uh, stars and people you'd love to meet, three people you'd invite to a dinner party. Dead or alive? Dead or alive. Oh, okay. Dead or alive. Mm. Um, Barry think... Antoinette. Oh, okay. Because oh, I've just, just... His star, yeah. A lot of people go down mm. to that kind of historical... I'd just like to get inside right. her head. Like, was she really that vacuous? Was she really that, you know... <laughs> you know, I just like would like to get inside her head. Because I don't think she was. I think she was... I, I, um, where was I? <laughs> I have to think now. You've two left. I've, I know, I know I've two left. But I went to see an exhibition of paintings by an artist who lived at the same time as her. And the paintings would just give an impression that she wasn't as vacuous as... As she comes across, mm -hmm. you know, and the story around this woman. It was in there, it was actually in New York, and the Met uh, last a couple of years ago. Um, a woman painter, which was unusual at the time, and Marie Antoinette encouraged her, and so you kind of think, hey, there was more to this woman. So she'd be one, okay? okay. Um, Bill Clinton. Oh, yeah. Which you met in 98 when. I did. Yeah. Well, I didn't meet him personally. Oh. My sister pushed forward and shook his hand. I, <laughs> I wouldn't be seen to be doing that, but yeah. Um, I, but I watching him in action over the years, and I mean, there's a great. When he was in Limerick, he just the man's mind and his his ability and anybody who will who has been met him or been in his presence, his ability to capture a room and his charisma and his he's so smart and he's so look at him making speeches the way you know he knows how to play he, a crowd he knows how to play mm. a crowd he knows how to read a room and in Limerick when he was in Limerick that time I think uh, the mayor of Limerick got up and was talking about uh, Frank McCourt and the book and all the rest of it and now Limerick people. It's like Dublin people when Fair City went, we don't talk like that. <laughs> actually do. Limerick are the same. Things were never as bad as Frank McCourt. They don't, they, they disavow a lot of it. But anyway, so the mayor was going on, so there was kind of in the crowd, you know, we're not impressed. No, don't be tagging us with Frank McCourt, really. It was never as bad as that. And Clinton just stands up and he says, look, Limerick, look at Limerick today. How proud would Frank McCourt be if he came back here and saw Limerick today? Shoot, they all <laughs> He has them eating out of the palm of his hand and say, He's just amazing. He's just mm. amazing. And I also reckon he's funny and he's, you know, yeah. so I would like him. Take, take a couple of whiskeys with him now. Nice. Yes. yes, and Roger Federer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> very good. Do you have any more? Uh, no. no. Um, um, we, we always ask our guests yeah. any advice for look, DC students might be listening to this, whoever else. Ourselves. Yeah, ourselves. students. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, just about like trying to get into the industry, making the industry just are any just in life. Any you see, it has changed so much. Uh, and you know, as I said, I started out as an announcer, so I didn't have formal journalistic training. I came the college route and then um, 
my journalism was basically, I think we got one little course from, you know, one of the senior journalists in the newsroom in, in writing for radio and television. And that was really aimed more at people who had been writing for newspapers who would tend to be long, long form. Yeah. We had a great sub on the radio desk who would say, if you can't tell your story in 45 seconds, it's not worth telling, you know. Um, so that kind of thing. But actually, I had done, you see, you never know how things are going to influence. When, when, when I was doing French, we had a, a part of our paper in first, second and third year, it was a précis. So you got a, a piece of a novel and you had to summarise it in 100 words or 200 words, which mm. basically was subbing. Yeah. So I was doing that in French before I ever thought yeah, of yeah. being a journalist. <laughs> you know? So you never know what's going to come back and help you as mm. you go on. Um, so it's very different. So it's hard to say. I know. I mean, you wouldn't get inside the door now without some kind of a journalism degree or a degree in communications or something. So it just has changed. Well, you but definitely need a bit of everything now. That's what it does a bit of everything. Around. I still. I mean, I'm, I'm still seeing people coming through. But we have what we call runners in the newsroom, mm -hmm. and they're the guys that are handing me my running order and my scripts. And geez, I forgot my earpiece. Will you run out and bring me in that bag? And they run literally. Go down to the library for tapes and you know all the rest of it. And. Angus McGreen was a runner. Paul Cunningham was a runner. Like a lot of people have come through that, mm -hmm. and a lot. But what I see now is that a lot of those kids are communication students as well, mm -hmm. and they're getting a chance then to maybe just do the odd shift, subbing shift, or and they can. Mm -hmm. So you still can come in that way, you mm -hmm. know. But I don't even know where you see it. Where you start, you know yeah. where you see it. I know that in RTE now there's this kind of digital first, um, mm -hmm. is the mantra. Um, <clears throat> so the focus is changing all the time. Will there be bulletins as I present them in 20, 30 years time? I don't know. So it's hard to know. I think, um, I, I sometimes look back, so I was 60 earlier this year, and I sometimes look back. No, don't be lying to us. So I sometimes look back. Greg was about to ask you out on a date at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you did your research properly, you'd know. <laughs> I did. I I even learned how to pronounce oh, oh for heart. I was pronounced. I was pronouncing it wrong. Colin corrected me. So oh, very good. Yeah, yeah. That's my husband's better standard of Gaelic than Greg. Uh, All right, take it but, easy. But I'd be kind of looking back at things that I might have said or did when I was twenty, and I'd kind of say, I'd stand over that. So I would think, trust your instincts, and I think when you're younger, you don't. And you're afraid and you're, you kind of think, what do I know? Don't always feel you have to know everything or that you have to say everything. Or, you know, sometimes it's better just to sit back and be sure about, you know, you know, that we all know them. These people who feel they have to have an opinion on everything. You don't actually, you know, and, and unless it's, it's completely formed and informed, don't keep your mouth shut. But trust your instincts, I think. I've been telling that to God for years. <laughs> <laughs> Years, you've known him one year. <laughs> oh, it's been a long year. <laughs> it felt like a long, it's long. A long year. Um, right, I suppose we've reached a, a natural conclusion. Um, Eileen, thanks a million for, for coming in. You're welcome. And good luck all today. three. What, what's, what's, what's the, what, where are you going? Where are we going? Um, um, well, like we're all in communication. If Colm has his way, RT. Yeah. 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 If, um, um, look, uh, yeah, this, is, this has been a great a little thing for us to, yeah, to have been doing the past mm -hmm. few months. And if it does... Uh, uh, turn into some sort of broadcasting career, be it RTE, be it anywhere else. Dublin is probably anywhere that'll have us. Anywhere that'll have us. Uh, Dublin, ideally. Um, but yeah. And how many in the class? And do they kind of structure you? Well, this is, well, part this is completely extracurricular. The, yes, I know. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, Dublin is part of the media production society. Yeah. So oh. you were in the top. So yeah. 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 Um. There's about a hundred in our in our degree, just in and around, give or take. Um. Not everybody has the same interests as us, obviously, but. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, some sort of future in broadcasting career, hopefully, fingers crossed. Okay, and by the way, the power is not in the broadcasting, the power is behind it. There you go, that's, that's, our, so, sta that's our statement for the episode now. So for the, um, you know, for the people who are interested in product, they're the ones that end up director generals, and mm. it's not that it's never the broadcasters. Mm. So I'll just leave you with that. Mm. Right. Well, awesome. I could pull the strings. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Th thanks. Thanks a million for You're coming welcome. in, Eileen. Oh, oh um, wait, because you know we love giving. Since they did give us this lovely room, do you like our new fancy room? And it's your room. Okay. No, not really. No. But, but but it is our lovely new student centre. Yeah. It is very lovely. It, I, I did mm. tell Colm on the way up. My son did a stint here, and he didn't. It just he did the same room. course as me that, that I I did. Oh, for, whatever. He lasted a, just a tad bit longer than I did. I did. 
two days, he did a year and a half. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. It's so, he's in DIT now, and he's just doing business and financial accounting and stuff, and it suits him. He just, college life didn't do it for him. He's happier in the smaller class and mm-hmm. all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But I love this. And I, I mean, I was too young. When I went to UCD, DCU didn't exist, or if it is, it was really only starting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I was broken hearted when he left here because it was just so handy and it was so everything. And yeah. I thought, mm-hmm. get stuck in there now. But it just wasn't for him. So there you go. That's life. Um, and he's grand where he is, but I love it. And I, even your student centre is fantastic. I love yeah, the whole village atmosphere. Two, two, three weeks. Three two, weeks yeah. Is that all? Oh, yeah. well, Michael right. D was here to open it. Was he? Yeah. yeah. Well, well uh, are we, anyway, yeah, okay, we'll have that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> are we yeah. watching the debate? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, this has been in conversation with Eileen Dunn from the aforementioned new student centre. We'll be back very soon with another episode. Thank you very much for listening and goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Nice. That'll be, that's the first one in the in the books, anyways. Lovely. Glad we have a nice award. Yeah. yeah. Ash, look, we have. Be grand. We actually do have a, a second interview coming up now today as well. With. Uh, David McCullough. Oh, very good. Yeah, David's yeah. coming in. Yeah. Um, any any anything? Uh, any little information for us? Gives a. Um. I slept with him once. <laughs> <laughs> That's what well, his wife used to joke that we slept together once. We slept beside each other outside for focus. You know, the, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. it was only a couple of weeks ago. I didn't do it this year. Okay, but he yeah. was beside yeah, me and didn't. Right, so okay. you can say that to him. I believe you slept around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we'll say that to him and then depending on his reaction, we'll be like, in context, yeah. it was yeah. That's like uh, when I started working in the hotel, this woman came up to me and she was like, Who are you again? I told her and she's like, Do you know? My husband was nearly your father. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess somebody so else So tell us now, what's, what's your second name? Uh, Mulhall. Mulhall, if you're looking out for you now. Oh, God. <laughs> who are you writing for? Uh, the, well, I do, I do it for a couple, mainly the Leinster Express and Leash. Yeah. Um, Who's the editor of that now? Uh, the Leinster Express, so it's Pat Summers. Oh, yeah, is it? Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, Pat's yeah. been there a good they few used years. To, um, they used to sponsor the P- Leash Person of the Year Award, which yeah. I presented for many years. Oh, Yes. Have you ever picked yeah. up any of them, Greg? I, I um, had one too. I was mortified. They sprang it on me. I wasn't expecting oh, it. Personally. When you were there to present it, like, and then they were like, yeah. oh. And I mean, I'm not, like, I was born in Dublin, but uh-huh. a lot of leash would claim me. Yeah, well, we don't have much, like, so we yeah, do close. Electric yeah. picnic. That's great. Just, you know, yeah, says, yeah, right. It's where you were born, Dunner. It's where you were born. Mm-hmm. But anyway, uh, so one night, yeah, so Brian Cowan, I thought, was coming up just to present flowers and, you know, say a few words, mm-hmm. and he presented it to me. Mm-hmm. Because there had been 10 or 12 awards and then it's usually the ultimate award winner is usually came out of the different yeah, section yeah. awards. Yeah. But I didn't, I didn't know anything. Sorry. Uh, yeah, we'll grab a photo. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'll leave my stuff.